And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, would my insecure supervisor ask to take a mental health day if I refused his offer of a ride home? And with the new Fitbit technology now able to more closely monitor fibrillation, how about you pass me another one of those deep fried cream puffs? <laughs> and now, the podcast host whose body is a temple and his bald head the steeple, Pete <laughs> Dominic! Uh, yes, we are so lucky to have you. Each and every day with your wonderful and original introductions. Thank you very much, Pico, and welcome to another episode of Stand Up. Oh, do I have a good one for you today. I've got Eugene Linden joining me. He's an award-winning journalist. He's been writing on science, nature, and in the environment. He's the author of nine books for over three decades. His new book, Fire and Flood, the people's history of climate change from 1979 to the present, is really good, very important. I think you will like, love our conversation. And Dr. Megan May is back. It's been far too long since we talked to this infectious disease and epidemiology expert. She joins me from Maine, where we talk about ticks and Lyme disease and, of course, all things COVID. So that is who is joining me on the program Along with you, thank you for pressing play and subscribing this week. I am sponsored by Indeed.com. So if you're looking to hire somebody for your firm, for your job, go to Indeed.com slash stand up. I'll tell you more about that later. Right now, I want to get to the news. Time to talk about everything that happened yesterday and more. It's time for the last 24. Here is Today in One Sentence from WTF. Just happened today's Matt Viser on day 448 of the Biden administration. There are 211 days until the midterm elections. And Matt writes, the January 6th committee reportedly has enough evidence to refer Trump for criminal charges. Trump Jr. texted then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows ideas for overturning 2020 election before it was called. A leader of the Proud Boys pleaded guilty to two felony charges and agreed to cooperate with the Justice Department. Philadelphia reinstated its citywide indoor mask mandate after a 50 percent increase in COVID-19 cases in the past 10 days. President Biden announced a new federal rule to regulate homemade guns. The White House warned that the Labor Department's Consumer Price Index report will show that inflation is extraordinarily elevated and 71 percent of Americans now blame Vladimir Putin for the recent increase in gas prices. That's today in one sentence by WTF just happened today's Matt Visor. Thanks, Matt. And now let's get to some of the audio I've got for you. Here is President Biden yesterday uh, with his comments about announcing the finalization of a rule banning sales of so-called ghost guns, the hard-to-trace firearms that law enforcement is increasingly recovering at crime scenes across the country. He was at a Rose Garden speech with survivors and family members of victims of gun violence in attendance. Here we go. The NRA called this rule I'm about to announce extreme. <laughs> extreme. But let me ask you. Is it extreme to protect police officers, extreme to protect our children, extreme to keep guns out of the hands of people who couldn't even pass a background check? Look, the idea that someone on a terrorist list could purchase one of these guns is extreme. It isn't extreme. Just basic common sense. You know... If you buy a couch you have to assemble, it's still a couch. If you order a package like this one over here that includes the parts you need, the direction of assembling a functioning farm, you bought a gun. Take a look. Where's he going? Take a look at this. They're packaged. This package. You can see the picture down here, maybe. This is the gun. He's got a gun. It's not hard to put together. The pieces of a gun. A little drill, hand drill at home. He's put the gun together. Doesn't take very long. Up here. Anyone can order it in the mail. Anyone. Wow. Okay. Hmm. Folks, a felon, a terrorist, a domestic abuser can go from a gun kit yeah. to a gun as little as 30 minutes 
well, the president just had a piece of a bunch of pieces of gun, parts of a gun, and it looked like he was trying to put it together. And it made me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Well, the president uh, went on. Uh, he also announced the nomination of the former uh, former federal prosecutor to be the lead at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And he apparently, according to the White House, there were approximately 20,000 suspected ghost guns recovered by law enforcement in criminal investigations last year, a tenfold increase from 2016. More from President Biden in the Rose Garden yesterday. We need Congress to pass universal background checks. Universal background checks. And I know it's controversial, but I got it done once. Ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines. I was getting criticized when I first passed this law when I was a senator. And guess what? I was down in southern Delaware, do a lot of hunting and fishing down there. And I was walking up one of the creek beds. And the guy standing there said, you want to take my gun? I said, I'll take your gun. He said, well, you're telling me I can't have more than X number of bullets in 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 my gun. And I said, what do you think the deer you're hunting or wear Kevlar vest? What the hell do you need 20 bullets for? You must be a hell of a terrible shot. (laughs) I'm serious. Think about it. Think about the mass shootings. Many as a hundred rounds. It's a weapon of war. Nothing to do with recreation. All right, there you go. I think they'd probably say it's for self-defense, Mr. President, but who am I to know? Okay, well, let me change gears and head over to The View where my friend Sonny Hostin talked about what it was like to be in that same Rose Garden when she and so many other influential black women in every sector of the country were there to welcome Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson as she was officially introduced as a Supreme Court associate Supreme Court justice. And when she came up um, and started speaking, uh, we, you know, we were applauding her um, and I was holding it in because the cameras were everywhere and I was thinking people are watching me. And then when she said, um, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. Um, and we, wow. I kind of just started to do this <laughs> ugly cry thing and I saw the camera there and my friend, uh, Professor Dyson says, just let it go, sis. <laughs> and all these tears start dropping yeah. and I put my sunglasses on and then I think it was the mayor of Tacoma, Washington. She's like, thanks a lot. And then she starts crying and everyone starts crying, but it felt like a family reunion. Yeah. Um, and what was really special was that her family was there, but all of of these black women collectively we all sort of sighed and i think it's because we have been the only in the room for so long i love that i thought that was great i wanted to share that with you now something i didn't think was great that i found a uh, great offense with was david mamet the famous playwright uh, he was on the horrible mark levin's fox news show and he basically suggested that a lot of teachers a lot of male teachers are pedophiles and it was so horrific and people were outraged outraged at what mammoth said and i'm one of them and now you might be too here's david mammoth saying these horrible things that i thought you might want to hear because maybe you bought tickets to american buffalo on broadway or maybe you were thinking about it now maybe you don't want to put money in david mammoth's pocket but we, we have to take back control if there's no community control of the schools uh, what we have is um First of all, where do they not have community control of the schools? What do you think the Board of Education is? He's just making shit up. Which, of course, he's good as a playwright to do. Kids being not only indoctrinated, but but groomed. Oh, there it is. That's the word. Groomed. You heard how he said it. And that we're going to hear a lot more. Groomers. We're all groomers. In, in, In a very real sense, by people who are... Whether they know it or not, sexual predators. Are they abusing the kids uh, physically? N- no, I don't think so. But they're abusing them mentally and, use- and using um, sex to do so. This has always been the problem with education, is that teachers are uh, inclined, particularly men because men are predators, to uh, pedophilia. 
teachers are inclined to pedophilia, particularly male teachers are inclined to pedophilia. Huh. Wow. That's a thing to say. So deeply damaging and damaged. And that's why there were strict um, community strictures about it. What? Uh, thank God. So this started to break down when the schools said, you know what? We have to teach the kids about sex. Why? Because what if they don't do it at home? I mean, none of that is even remotely close to true. He just put together a whole bunch of bullshit and spun it on Fox News. None of that happened. It's just so bizarre and sad. That's David Mamet on Fox News with the awful Mark Levin. And speaking of awful, this is football player Cam Newton with the worst kind of sexism. He's on a show on Barstool Sports Million Dollars Worth of Game podcast. He's a free agent quarterback. He's 32 years old. He opened about, up at about his childhood before segueing to his views of women's roles. And it got really sexist really quick. And the co-hosts seem to be uncomfortable. And Newton, of course, who last played for the Carolina Panthers, faced backlash in 2017 for making a sexist dig at a female sports reporter. You might ask me, why are you going to play this? Well, I wonder if you know anybody like this who thinks like this. And uh, send him my way. I'd love to. I'd love to have him on the podcast and try to understand how their brain works. Here's Cam Newton. I had a, a perfect, a perfect example of what a man was in my life by my father. Mm-hmm. My parents have been together for 36, 37 years now, and it's, and it's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in a three-parent household, my mom, my father, and my grandmother. And uh, I knew what a woman was, not a bad bitch. Mm-hmm. Okay, what's the difference? A woman. Okay. A bad bitch is a person who's just, you know, girl, I'm a bad bitch. You know, I'm doing yeah. this. I'm doing that. I, I, I looked apart, but I don't act apart. Okay. You know, and it's a lot of women who are bad bitches. And I say bitches in, in, in a way not to degrade a woman, but just to, to, to go off the aesthetic of what they deem is a boss chick. Mm-hmm. Now, a woman for me is handling your own, but knowing how to cater to a man's needs. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think a lot of times when you get that aesthetic of like, I'm a boss bitch, like I'm a this, I'm a dad. No, baby. Like, but you can't cook. Okay. You yeah. don't know. You don't know when to be quiet. You mm-hmm. don't know how to allow a man to lead. Oh boy. A lot to unpack. <laughs> A lot to unpack there from Cam Newton. Do we know anybody like that? Send him, send him my way, please, by all means. I'd. Uh, what is he going to now sell? What could he be a sponsor? What could he sponsor for? Something really manly and super sexist, I guess. Oh boy, whatever any of it means anymore. Now let's head over to CNN Plus, where Casey Hunt was talking about the Pennsylvania Senate race. President Trump, former President Trump, thank God, he endorsed Dr. Oz. And apparently a lot of conservatives are really pissed about it because Dr. Oz is not that conservative, apparently. Well, let's let Casey Hunt take it from here and you get to hear the ad of one of Dr. Oz's conservative primary. I mean, they're, they're all fighting over Trump's approval. It's it's just a race to the bottom. But I really like this. <laughs> here it is. The Monday after this endorsement from Trump came down, the Republican who was trying desperately to get that endorsement, who's got all those Trump advisors working for him, who's considered a more kind of run of the mill standard candidate. It's a guy named David McCormick. He's married to a former Trump administration official. He put out this ad about Dr. Oz. The real Mehmet Oz. Senator Clinton, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Dr. Fauci is too, but he's a very disciplined leader. He's a wonderful scientist. We work with China. And I love working in China. Challenging your beliefs about what it means to be male or female. How do we keep guns out of the wrong person's hands? The greatest national security threat that we have is obesity. And we haven't had any interaction with President Trump at all. Mehmet Oz, a complete and total fraud. Oh, that is a rough ad. You know, I mean, can you imagine putting yourself out there to run for office and say, what's the worst thing? What's the worst thing they're going to do to me or or say about me? How about complete and total fraud? (laughs) Ah, Dr. Oz, what were you thinking? Karma for all that bullshit. 
pseudoscience who peddling on your stupid TV show coming back to get you. Because that horrible ad is absolutely accurate. Dr. Oz is definitely a fraud. And who do Democrats like down there? John Fetterman, Malcolm Kenyatta, Alexandria Khalil, or Connor Lamb, who is the leading candidate down there? That's who is running for the primary on the Democratic Party ticket in Pennsylvania. Will one of them take on Dr. Oz? All right, now let's get to my friend, Dr. Jason Johnson. He was on MSNBC with Ari Melber yesterday. He was talking about this ad from Governor Kay Ivey, who said big tech and liberals stole the election from Donald Trump. Here's Dr. Jason Johnson breaking down the strategy. This is where the money is. This is where you, you can all, Ari, you can always follow the money. Republicans mm. across the country see that the people who are aligned with MAGA, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and Donald Trump, that is the place where you raise money to run. Look, the, the, nest, the neck and the wrist don't lie, right? They, they see where the cash is and they say that if I take on these crazy positions, I will have access to that campaign cash. So it's dangerous for democracy, but beneficial for politicians like Ivy and people around the country to promote this lie. <laughs> All right, this is really my concern going into 2022. There are Republicans like Kay Ivey, like Ted Cruz, who do know the truth, right? Mo Brooks, they, they, you know, they, they'll pretend, but they do know the truth. They know that Joe Biden won the election. They saw the numbers. They, they've made private phone calls. They know what these secretary of states, Republicans and Democrats have said. They're just liars, right? They're just doing whatever is convenient. They're going to blame big tech, big blue, big pun, whatever. They're going to blame somebody, right? But they know that that's just for, for performance pun. sake. What frightens me Exactly. Uh, what frightens me is a lot of the people who you see running now for the, the midterms are they believe this stuff. They're not just doing this for mm. performance sake. They really do believe that the election was stolen. And that is infinitely more dangerous. I can tolerate the people who are inveterate liars like Ted Cruz. I can tolerate the quizlings mm. and the weasels who just say, hey, I'm going to do whatever it is I need. But the people who are true believers, they're dangerous. People who are at the Stop the Steal rally who now want to be secretaries of state, that is a danger to our democracy. Man, he's good at talking. That's Dr. Jason Johnson on MSNBC laying an ad for you accurately and as succinctly as one can, in my opinion. Love him. Trying to get him on this week, as a matter of fact. Now, Rachel Maddow returned to the airwaves on MSNBC last night. Before that, I think Ali Velshi, who was in Eastern Europe for five weeks, doing amazing and hopefully award-winning work, bringing attention to the refugee crisis and so much more pertaining to Putin's invasion in Ukraine. Anyway, Maddow was back, and she announced last night that she's going to scale back to Mondays only on MSNBC. Whoo, how sweet it is. Things I realized, to my surprise, um, is that I actually don't really need another hiatus. This one was great, but I think I only needed the one. I do still have all these other irons in the fire, all these other things I'm working on that I want to bring to fruition. None of them are fast. All of them take a long time, and I'm still working on all of them. But I don't think I need another big stretch of time off. So here's the plan. I'm back. I'm going to be here all this month, Monday through Thursday nights. Um, now, for big news events, for things like the lead up to the election, I will, of course, be here more than that. Um, but that is the general plan. I will be here this month, Monday through Thursday nights. And then starting next month, starting in May, I'm going to be here weekly. I'm going to be here on Monday nights, again, to give myself just more time to work on some of this other stuff that I've got cooking for MSNBC and NBC. So Monday to Thursday nights this month, starting next month, I will be uh, I will be here weekly. OK, wow. Well, that shook a lot of people up last night. A lot of people that love watching Rachel Maddow every night. Well, I'll tell you, I'll still be here every day. I've been doing the, this podcast every day for almost two years, every weekday, that is, and haven't really taken much of a break, even when I took a vacation i still posted episodes from my vacation of interviews i did the week before but next week i'm going to try to do something different next week i am going to be solo val is taking the girls to see her family in california and i am solo and i think i don't know what i'm going to do but i'm definitely going to take a few days off but i'm still going to post podcasts every week next week rachel maddow had her announcement i'm having mine now I'm going to have some guest hosts next week. 
Essie Cup is going to be interviewing Stephen Hassan. I think that one's confirmed. Bill B in D.C. is going to select somebody to interview. And I got a few other ideas up my sleeve. Who are two people that are coming on this show on a regular basis that you would love to hear talk to each other? I wanted to leave a few of those bookings up to you. If you get back to me today, I can try to reach out. Who would be two people that come on the show regularly that you would like to hear talk to each other? Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. What's it going to be? Is it going to be Ritholtz and Aaron Carroll, Eric Siegel and Arthur Kaplan? Who would you like to hear talk to each other here on the show? I'd love to hear from you on that. So email me, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com with your suggestions. Lots of email from listeners over the past couple of days and several submissions for the vitamin N, which is just photos of nature with no man-made objects. If you have any photos of nature, take some, send them now. They got to be timely, like seasonal, like the last few days or so. Take a picture and send it to me. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com, especially if you are a subscriber. I mean, most of the time I think it's subscribers sending them to me, but I will post it in the subscriber daily email that comes along, obviously, with the show for you to listen to. But right now, it's time to get to all of the rest of the headlines, rapid-fire style. Time for the news dump. Pete Coe, what have you for us today? This jingle is based on a story from New Mexico titled, El Rito Sheep Rancher Loses Most of Herd After Dog Attacks. Oh, no, 250 sheep killed by dogs on the loose in a known New Mexico ranch. And here is the jingle from Pete Coe. Angry dog from down the road, over the fence it jumps. The sheep didn't stand a chance on today's news dump. <laughs> oh, no, that is absolutely horrible. I think it was more than one dog, though. Pete, thank you. As always, well, the two Buffalo police officers who pushed a 75-year-old man during a Black Lives Matter protest in June 2020 have been exonerated. The two police officers were part of the police line that was clearing protesters out of the area at City Hall when they approached demonstrator Martin Gugino. You've seen this video, and apparently these two cops got away with it, and it's uh, really, I think, disappointing. I mean, I- I'm not sure how, but Buffalo police officers cleared that uh, pushed over 75-year-old protester, who, by the way, spent a month in the hospital, and he's 75. He's probably never going to have a full recovery from the horrible head injury that he suffered as a result. Anyway, Jared Kushner's Saudi paid a $2 billion deal with Prince came months after exiting the White House. A New York Times report says before giving billions to Jared Kushner, Saudi investment fund had big doubts, but he got a $2 billion bucks. What? Well, how is that? You got a, a $2 billion secured investment from a fund led by the Saudi prince. Mm, I wonder what that's all about. A jury has convicted a former Virginia police officer for his role in a January 6th riot. Former colleague testified against the Rocky Mount police officer named Thomas Robertson, who was convicted Monday. Multiple charges stemming from his role in the January 6th breach of the Capitol. Mention this briefly at the top, but Philadelphia has decided to restore the indoor mask mandate as cases have arrived there. They've become the first major U.S. city to reinstate its indoor mask mandate after reporting a sharp increase in coronavirus infections. Most states and cities dropped their masking mandates requirements in February and early March following new guidelines from the CDC. The restaurant industry pushed back against the reimposed masking, saying workers will bear the brunt of customer anger over the new rules. In New York City, Mayor Eric Adams has paused his push to unwind many of the city's virus rules as cases have risen, opting for now to keep a mask mandate for two to four year olds in city schools and preschools. The latest outbreak has struck many high-profile officials in Washington. Anderson Cooper was the latest high-profile person I heard to get coronavirus. But you heard about Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff and so many others. All right, how about this story from California? Pacific Gas and Electric is set to pay $55 million over massive wildfires. The nation's largest utility has agreed to pay this sum to avoid criminal prosecution for two major wildfires sparked by its aging Northern California power lines and submit 
After five years of oversight in an attempt to prevent more deadly blazes, the company didn't acknowledge any wrongdoing in the settlement announced Monday with prosecutors in six counties ravaged by last year's Dixie Fire and the 2019 Kincaid Fire. The utility still faces criminal charges for a 2020 wildfire in Shasta County that killed four people. Finland and Sweden are set to join NATO as soon as summer. A massive headline that cannot be what Vladimir Putin wanted out of this invasion and war that he started. Julia Yaffe tweeting about this story that Finland and Sweden are set to join NATO wrote, I kept telling you that Putin is not a master strategist, but you didn't believe me. All right, what else do I have for you? Apparently, Tucker Carlson has bragged to a group of churchgoers. He didn't say it on his TV show, but he was in San Diego talking to the Awaken Church on April 2nd, apparently. It was reported yesterday that uh, the Fox News host mocked the idea of getting a second booster shot and said, quote, I skipped the first three, so now... Tucker Carlson now bragging that he's not vaccinated against COVID-19, which is really interesting because in January, CNN's Jim Acosta called on the host to disclose his vaccination status. And that assessment now appears to be wrong. Well, how can he go into Fox News if he's not vaccinated? That's the question I have. They have a rule that you have to be. So what, does he just not go into the studio? Is that the deal? All right, the music's about to run out so quickly. The U.S. airport that is number one in the world now for passenger volume is Atlanta. That's right. Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport is once again the world's busiest airport. Etsy sellers have launched a week-long strike over increased fees. A Texas judge has dismissed a murder charge in a self-induced abortion case due to insufficient evidence. In Thanks to Leslie and Tom at Noble Pies, I know about this story. Scientists are risking an arrest to demand climate action. A growing international movement called Scientist Rebellion is calling on world leaders to end the burning of fossil fuels. Look into these brave scientists who have been demonstrating and getting arrested over and over. Those are your headlines on today's News Dump. And now it's time to get to my great guests. I've got two awesome guests joining me today. Author of Fire and Flood, a people's history of climate change from 1979 to the present, Eugene Linden. And then Dr. Megan May joins me. She's an infectious disease expert. And we talk about Lyme disease, COVID and more. But I do have to tell you about this week's sponsor, which is Indeed.com, because if you're a business and you want to hire new people, take your business to the next level. You need the right team and Indeed makes it easy to hire and build that team with the right skills to make your dreams a reality. So if you're hiring, you guys, you need Indeed. Indeed.com slash stand up because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applicants that meet your must have requirements or else you don't pay. Listen to listener Frank Zarinsky, whose awesome media company, Motion City Media, has had great success with Indeed.com, has hired a couple people for his company, Motion City Media. Frank, thanks for listening, and thanks for letting me know that Indeed is working for you. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. And that is Indeed, because they partner with you in every step of the process. You can find great talent through all their tools like Indeed Instant Match Assessments and virtual interviews. So start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your post at Indeed.com slash stand up. This offer is valid through April 30th. Go to Indeed.com slash stand up to claim your $75 credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash stand up. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Now I'm very excited to get to my first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, he is an award-winning journalist and writer on science, nature, and the environment. He's the author of nine books of nonfiction and one novel. His previous book on climate change, The Winds of Change, explores the connection between climate change and the rise and fall of civilizations. He was awarded, that was awarded, a Grantham Prize Award. And for many years, he wrote about nature and global environmental issues for Time Magazine, where he garnered several awards. And we're very happy to have him joining me on the show for the first time. 
fire and flood of people's history of climate change from 1979 to the present. I think you're really going to like this. I learned a lot from both our guests today. Let's kick it off with Eugene Linden. You can find him online at eugenelinden.com. Let's do it. All right. Well, I've just told you all about him, and now I've got him here. Eugene Linden, welcome to Stand Up. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Really excited to talk to you about your new book. Well, happy to be here. Thank you. Yes, you've been writing about this issue for much of your career. Fire and flood, a people's history of climate change from 1979 to the present. I want to make sure everybody watching can see the, the wonderful cover. You open in your book, you, you, uh, you say that this is, if you, don't, if you don't think climate change is a problem, this is not a book for you. You're not going to try to convince them that the threat is real. But then you offer a suggestion uh, as some <laughs> advice. Could you tell us what suggestion you have for people who think that climate change is not real? Oh, uh, go down to Florida, start an insurance company and assume wind risk and uh, underprice the uh, the state, which it does it. You'll get all sorts of business. And if you're right, you'll make a fortune by a big condo in Florida, too. And if you're wrong, you'll lose your shirt, I'm uh, guessing. Yeah, yeah, you'll be bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's get into that because there's so many there's so much to talk uh, about this book. I'm hoping uh, you enjoy our conversation enough that you'll come join me because I, I won't uh, really even scratch the surface. But let's talk about the insurance industry, because they are an industry that are a, a canary in, in the coal mine. And uh, tell us about what you learned and and researching and covering their choices. Well, way back in 1993, I wrote an article for Time magazine about the insurance industry and climate change because I realized back then that that is the sharp end of the stick when it comes to understanding risk in terms of whether there is a climate related risk. And I thought they'd turn out to be the white knight of uh, the climate change story and that in the past that their lobbying had helped lead to the uh, laws on seatbelts, electrical standards, and all sorts of things where they were wanting to uh, change behavior to mitigate a risk. Sure. Well, they turned out to be a very timid white knight on climate change. The reinsurance end of the industry, which is the end of the industry that takes up catastrophic risk, has been wonderful on climate change in the sense that they've done some of the best studies of what the economic costs of climate change might be and how it poses the climate change poses an existential risk to their industry because if you misprice, if the patterns of the past no longer apply in the future, you're likely to underprice the risk and you will go bankrupt. And indeed, in 1992, about a dozen insurance companies were rendered insolvent by Hurricane Andrew, which hit Miami and caused about $50 billion in damage. So why didn't? And now uh, this is actually one of the triggers that led me to write the book, because mm. a couple of years ago, I read, I was reading an article in the New York Times, and it was talking about a big fire in California, the Camp Fire, caused $12.5 billion in damage. Yeah. And an insurance lobbyist was saying, yeah, we're all scrambling to understand this new risk of climate change. And I thought, what? <laughs> you know, wait, I wrote about this 25 years ago or uh, whatever it was back then. And you understood the risk very well back then. So what happened over those 25 years that the insurance industry kept writing policies for people in harm's way or going into harm's way in the fire zones of California. And to some degree, of course, in the coastal areas of Florida, that's a slightly different story. And what happened was I misunderstood the degree to which the incentives at the retail end of the insurance industry to just keep writing business were running, the, driving the train. And secondly, it turns out that the industry is absolutely ingenious about offloading and spreading risk. For one thing, policies are renewable usually on a yearly basis. So if you get in trouble, you can either up the price of the policy or pull out of an area altogether. And that turns out not quite to be the case in some areas, but that always that's a get out of jail free card for them. But the second thing was, after Andrew uh, bankrupted all those insurance companies, they said, well, we don't want to pick up all these risks in the future. Right. And a very clever guy named Everhard Muller at Hanover Ray in Germany invented something called the cat bond. And what a cat bond is, is it's a bond. And an investor, usually an institutional investor in this case, buys his piece of the bond and he gets this very high interest rate for assuming a risk, say that a Category 5 hurricane isn't going to hit Miami in the next three years. Well, that's a pretty good bet to make because even if there's a 
if it goes from one in 100 to two in 100, that's still one in 50, which means over the next 50 years, you've got 49 chances it won't hit. And so it opened the gates for the insurance industry to access vast pools of institutional money and offload that risk. And so as a consequence between the motivations at the retail end and also the ability to spread risk at the other end, the industry didn't really have to play the role that it had played earlier with some where it would become more activist with other problems like seatbelts or electrical standards. So much more even than you just said in the book. And I think it's such an important industry to look at. You you look at every industry. You also obviously look at uh, the financial industry and, of course, the fossil fuel industry. But I think people haven't written and covered as much about the insurance, the homeowners, I guess, insurance industry specifically we're talking about. Yeah, right? property and casualty. Property well, and homeowners and businesses. And, yep. you know, it's it, it, because if you in, in, a, in, a, in a zone like uh, the fire zone of California, how are you going to get a mortgage if you don't have fire insurance? And what has happened, unfortunately, is that where insurers pulled out, as they did um, in California or have done just recently, the private market is pricing policies at sometimes 10 times their earlier prices. What that does is it prices insurance out of uh, affordability for a lot of middle class homeowners. And what happened and then what happens, unfortunately, is well, maybe not unfortunately, but the state steps in. That happened in Florida when all the insurers pulled out of Florida. The state created this citizens uh, insurance company, property insurance company, and it quickly became the largest insurer of uh, wind insurance in the state. And that shows you that they're underpricing risk because people would only go to them if they couldn't get a competitive bid in the private market. Same thing in California. This, there's a backstop uh, fair. And it, it's minimal, you know, bare bones insurance, but it's the only insurance some people can get right now. But what that does is that when you underprice something, you're creating an incentive. And the uh, underpricing of risk by the insurance industry and also by the uh, state and federal programs meant that millions and millions of people have moved into these zones since the dangers became apparent which just sets the stage for a bigger conflagration down the road. Yeah, so much. Uh, there's a different hazards, obviously, as you're talking about in Florida versus California. We could talk about the rest of the country in terms of climate change impacted disasters. But your book is so good. And everybody who cares about this issue, which is uh, should be all humans, is uh, <laughs> fire and flood. Everybody should have it on their bookcase. It covers... The, the story decade by decade, starting with the 80s and I think tracking really with, with your career as a journalist, you look at these interesting kind of four clocks that all move right. at different speeds, which I think really is what I love so much about the way you wrote this. They are the reality of climate change itself, the scientific consensus about it, which always lags reality, you say, public opinion and then political will, which lag further still and perhaps most important business and finance and the way that you cover all those different clocks, I think, as you call them, is such so relevant and important. And I don't think anybody else has really uh, done that, which is why I love it so much. But let's just real quick. The scientific consensus has been wrong on the point that it is worse than they predicted. Is that is that a fair statement? It's happening faster, at least. Is that a fair well, statement? Well, I, I would say yes. That um, First, the scientific consensus that it was a problem itself gelled in the early 90s. We've had that robust consensus for 25 years. But what hap- has happened is that the worst case scenarios of the 1990s are, in some cases, the conventional wisdom now, in some cases, the best cases now. And so... Early on, I would say that the consensus underestimated the risk, under vastly underestimated the rapidity with which it would be upon us as well, which is the second problem. It's not the fault of the scientists. They're actually being asked to study a phenomenon even as it's unfolding. Right. And as you mentioned a minute ago, a minute ago, there's a structural lag that they have to gather data, analyze it, have it peer reviewed, and then published. And they can't just sort of slap it into print immediately. And so, but the scientific community has actually been, since the mid-90s, heroic on the issue. Uh, The consensus has been there. 
And it's a bizarre phenomenon in which the public is decades behind the scientific community. Much of the public doesn't even acknowledge that climate is changing right now, even as we see the changes happening and affecting us. A lot of the public um, doesn't th see that there's a scientific consensus, even that we have, even though we have a more uh, solid, a more solid scientific consensus than we have that smoking is bad for your health. I mean, you can't have a more robust consensus than we have in in terms of the th uh, the reality and the threat of climate change. But so, is, but but is it yeah, but ahead. is it but is it bizarre because you spell it out pretty well in your book why people think what they do, why public opinion is what it is, and 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 who's behind it. So. You can, yeah. you can understand. We know where it comes from, why people think what they think and and care or don't care, don't we? Well, yes. I mean, we, we, we certainly know that there has been a well-organized and well-financed campaign to sort of fudge the science and, and and confuse the public that started at the very dawn of the climate era. And it's been a remarkably effective campaign, unfortunately. But the second thing that has happened that is even worse is that the issue became politicized. And um, I use the analogy um, of COVID because COVID became politicized immediately. And you had a situation where a substantial portion of the country didn't believe it existed or that it was no worse than the flu, even as they were getting sick and dying of it. And um, <laughs> because if something becomes politicized, it's uh, it, the facts don't matter. If the messenger is deemed to be illegitimate, then it doesn't really matter what they say. And if you can politicize a disease, a virus, for instance, which can actually kill you right now here and there, it's easy enough to politicize a threat which seems to lie far off in the future, even though that's not the case. That's for sure, especially when there is so much money at stake. And that's why I wanted to explore uh, the role of, of business and finance, which, which you write uh, extensively about, and, you know, it's this idea of the government in any way getting in the way of, of making profits. So it extends, as you say, to just a, a general anti-regulatory stance that, that people often have. Don't put any rules in my way. But as we all know, just basic economics, you got to pay for the consequences of whatever you do or you're supposed to. And in many ways, there are laws to, to make business be responsible. But on this one whether it be called pollution or climate, uh, that, that, that doesn't seem like the external fa factors are, are factored in is, is obviously been the observation for years, and they've been really good at creating that atmosphere. How good? Oh, yeah. I mean, the demonization of the science has, has been in incredibly effective, but you touched on something which I think is fundamental to our problem, and that is, is that the way we do business leaves us essentially blind to long-term threats. We have no way of integrating the long term into the short term because the, the motivation at the short term, as the example of the insurance industry shows, is to keep writing policies. It's to keep this business as usual has enormous momentum um, and it's very difficult to change. And so effectively, we have created an economic system that's configured to drive off cliffs and we need to adjust. And regulation does that, by the way, which is what you're saying. I mean, the, the way to integrate the long term health of the society is to uh, uh, is is through regulation because business is not going to self regulate um, and tax and, policy uh, or tax policy would be be great. Unfortunately, the maybe the most demonized thing there is is taxes and uh, taxes are a very efficient way of changing behavior. The great investor Leon Levy once remarked, that, "Give me control of the tax code and I'll give you any society you want because <laughs> you can you can create incentives and disincentives all you like." I mean, look at Eight dollars a pack for cigarettes. That's a disincentive for smoking. And uh, it could have been used. But unfortunately, that, too, became politicized. And so it's like a, a third rail of politics. There, there are probably about 50 third rails of politics right now. Yeah, the, the issue of smoking, though, the eight dollars for smoking was that do it makes you less likely to smoke. And the reason why we're not trying to control your behavior, we're trying to. Make sure that we don't have to pay for your health care. It's the same thing with climate. We we would we wish you could just do whatever you wanted, but if you just do whatever you want, the rest of us are going to have to pay for it. That's what I hear when I hear that kind of incentive. I mean, that's well, we, we are exactly right. But the think about climate. I just saw a study: ninety percent of fossil fuel emissions go into the atmosphere without paying any price whatsoever. In other words, one of the prices for uh, for fossil fuel emissions, of course, is air pollution, which kills eight point seven million people each year. 
So quite apart from climate, there are other reasons to clean up the air. What, one of the, the gifts of COVID, if I can use that phrase, was that for a matter of months, it showed the residents of New Delhi and Beijing and Shanghai and a host of other cities that, gee, this is what it's like when there's no air pollution. Yep. You could see the Himalayas for the first time in, from New De- Delhi in some people's lifetime. And so it's not just saving, cre- uh, preventing us from uh, moving into a climate uh, era which is inhospitable to human life. It's also about quality of life that we're living right now. So there's a host of different incentives that should be mobilizing us to change. And unfortunately, that they just continue to bubble beneath the surface and they haven't risen to the point where we're actually yeah. taking real action. You take us in fire and flood decade to decade, and I think my audience would most be interested based on the demographic research <laughs> I have, which is anecdotal. Uh, uh, in the 90s, I certainly would be uh, because it's certainly when when I came of age and, and started to uh, well, certainly became aware of of climate, global warming, as we used to call it. But when I started covering politics, I remember Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi both uh, sitting down on a couch doing an ad warning a PSA warning about climate change. And so I guess the question is, what happened in the 90s, Eugene? Well, it it wasn't political. I mean, there was the business and finance lobby against it for a long time. But then in the late 90s, it became politicized. And that's all she wrote. Um, And that uh, that was after the Clinton impeachment. Um, Any 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 cudgel at hand was going to be used. Right. Um, And uh, climate change, you know, when he had intellectuals to use George Wallace's phrase, you know, trying to tell you how to live and what to drive. And and you see a direct descendant of that in Trump talking about elites forcing you to have tiny windows. I have no idea where he got that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and and so once an issue becomes politicized, as we discussed before, it's it, it it's over in terms of a rational debate on uh, based on on facts. But the '90s was the most important decade because that's when we really lost the battle. If if China had chosen a different development path, they we would probably not be in the fix we are today because uh, they were half our emissions in 1990. They're twice our emissions now. And their emissions amount to the all the emissions of the European Union plus the G20 combined, which is an astonishing fact. And the reason for that is that we were giving them mixed messages. We were saying develop, you know, leapfrog and develop uh, with a renewable technology. You don't have to do what we did. At the same time, we were continuing to do what we did by using coal and also in the U.S., we, we through much of the climate age era, we've had government presidents who actually dismissed the issue as important. And so how can you assume that China or India or a developing nation is going to take the issue seriously if our president is saying right. it's a hoax, you know, or it's a it's a anti-business thing or it'll cripple your development? And so we were giving mixed messages. And so China developed using coal, and we're living with the consequences of that now. And the consequences are, are grievous in the sense that we are perilously close to losing control of this. And we have to act now, and yet we have two and a half billion more people than we had in 1990, and the emissions are 60% higher than they were in 1990. And we've got wars because of energy and oil. It, it's pretty, it seems uh, so imminent. All right. We didn't get to solutions. I didn't get to the positive, Eugene. Do you want to? uh... Yeah, I think there are solutions. I think uh, we could create zero carbon electricity cheaper than we create fossil fuel electricity or even other renewable electricity. There are technologies on the horizon that could vastly reduce our emissions. China, which is the largest emitter, is one of the worst, least energy efficient economies on the planet. China could actually drastically reduce their emissions and become more profitable at the same time by just becoming more energy efficient. There are a host of different things. We do see an extraordinarily rapid build out of EVs, for instance, and as charging stations proliferate, that shift is going to happen. But the consumers, if consumers actually begin to start becoming climate aware in the way in which they drive and do their purchases, uh, live their lifestyles, um, that would an incredible effect. It's 70% of the GDP of the economy. And um, it would cause businesses, which are already taking heed, and politicians would follow. And, you know, so it's, there is a power to the people, the power in the people. If the young actually voted on what they actually said they were going to vote on, <laughs> the, the electoral landscape would be different as well. 
So there's tons of things that could happen, and I hope do. Well, we'll have to leave it there because I uh, I know you got to run, but I really appreciate you joining me, and I hope that we can pick it up soon and, and talk about it again as I uh, finish the book, Fire and Flood, A People's History of Climate Change from 1979 to the present. Uh, you've had a, a very impressive career, and I really appreciate you you joining me to talk about your work today. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you as well. All right. There he goes. Eugene Linden, the new book, Fire and Flood. I highly recommend it. It was great to get him on for the first time. And now time to get to my second guest. She has become a regular on the program ever since she warned us about coronavirus back in December of 2019. She's got all kinds of degrees in microbiology and pathobiology, whatever that is, bacteriology. Her research focuses on the evolution of viruses, not only determining how new diseases appear and where they come from, but how to predict what new disease might arise next. And we talked about Lyme disease, we talked about COVID, and we had an awesome conversation, as we always do. I just love her personality. Everybody does. She's real. She's cool. She's funny. She's honest. She's passionate. She's Dr. Megan May. You should follow her on Twitter, where she's always very active. At DRMay5, D-R-M-A-Y-5. You should definitely go follow her there. Always a pleasure to catch up with her. Let's kick it off. I called her yesterday, and here we go. Hello? It's me. How are you? How are you? Eh, not bad. You got a tick? I... Uh, no, not me. Not today. You, <laughs> you found, you found a tick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I found one on Will the other day. We were out in my mom's yard and yep, he was, he had his first deer tick. My daughter got Lyme disease last summer. It is scary. So I, I, I can't remember if we've ever talked about this, but, um, so I had Lyme disease a couple of summers ago. It like first time I've ever had it. And I woke, I was fine on a Friday. I woke up Saturday morning and I was like, I am sick and there is something very wrong with me. And after an hour, like my fingers swelled up like crazy. And so I went, I think I have Lyme disease or some tick-borne nonsense. So I went to the walk-in clinic where, you know, I knew the nurse practitioner who was working that day. And I walked in and said, Allie, I think I have Lyme disease. And she went, yeah, that seems plausible. And just gave me tetracycline, like, you're wow. sorry, gave me doxy- doxycycline. Yeah. You know, didn't make me wait for the tests or anything like that. So I didn't have to like delay treatment, but I was not myself for six weeks. It mm. was terrible. And when I went into the walk-in clinic, it it's really hard to explain. So I might butcher this or it might sound just absolutely bizarre, but anybody who's had it might relate to this. I was like going to do the sign in and I wrote my name and then it asked for the date. And I stood there for a good 90 seconds and I could not, it wasn't just that I couldn't think of the date. It was like, I couldn't even think of like what to do, like how will I figure out the date? It almost, it it was, it was really scary. And then if eventually after like 60 seconds, I was like, well, it's summer. So it must be one of like three months. And then after 90 seconds, I was like, oh, I can look at my phone. But it literally took me that long where I'm just standing there holding a pen, staring at this piece of paper, like not only not knowing what to write, but not figuring out how I, not able to figure out how I would come to the right conclusion about what to write. It was, it was really scary. And again, I'd only had, I'd only been sick for less than a day. And so people who are living kind of chronically with that type of brain fog, I have incredible compassion for. Do you know about the that's crazy uh, Ava's Ava's illness was very mild, but it was it was not not good. Her foot all got all swelled up and we weren't sure. I'm not sure if that's where she got a tick. We never saw a tick. I never saw uh, the, yeah, the bullseye or anything. It just, yeah. She had a really weird, very swollen foot and she was definitely had 
she was ill. We had to pick her yeah, up from like camp. The fever and the whole yeah, thing. I yeah, picked her up from camp. Like went all the way up to Lake George, got her, brought her back. She stayed home for like one day, and she got on the on the drugs, and and she was back at camp. But so it wasn't it wasn't too bad for her. But I don't oh, know, I'm glad you know. to hear that. Yeah. So fun fact, okay? If uh, this is one of the various hills that I will die on in life, the bullseye rash. So you mentioned she didn't have the bullseye. So. The bullseye rash is great if it appears. It's totally diagnostic if it appears, but only about half of all Lyme patients ever get one. So for a long time, you had doctors saying, well, there's no bullseye, so you can't have Lyme disease, so I'm not going to treat you. And so you had these people that really did have it that were just left untreated for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks. And then like, the longer you go without treatment, the longer it takes to get yeah, right. back to normal. Yeah. And if you have people who go, you know, multiple months without treatment, then they, you know, they wind up at risk for having that post-treatment Lyme syndrome, like what some people call chronic Lyme disease, but um, it's, that's a whole other messy subject. But um, this idea of permanent damage being done, even if you can get rid of the organism and get rid of the infection with antibiotics, you still have, you know, these long-term consequences. And um, I totally lost my train of thought, well, but anyways, wanted, it's bad and sad. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the, the vaccine. I, I mean, I've, I've heard, I mean, we talked about this before. I know I've talked with people about it several times, but that at one point there was a vaccine for Lyme there disease was. and because uh, it got some kind of a bad, it got bad press or something. Do you know that story? Yeah. Oh, I know that story very well. So, so actually NPR had a pat podcast called patient zero and they have a whole episode about Lyme Ricks. And so I was actually on that episode a few years ago, but um, yes. Yeah, so there is, there was a Lyme disease vaccine called Lyme Ricks. It was made by the, company now is um, GlaxoSmithKline. And believe it or not, that vaccine is still FDA approved. It is, it still is licensed in the United States. It's just GSK doesn't manufacture it because no one wants to buy it. So here's what happened with that. Okay. So like remind your brain or sorry, rewind your brain to the mid nineties. Lyme disease is something that like we very occasionally hear about but it's not the way it's talked about today. And certainly like the incidence of having tick bites is not what it is today. It's like one of those, it's one of the most in your face measures of climate change, honestly, is like, if you yeah. think back to being a kid, how many ticks did you ever have on you? Yeah. Just to, and, yeah, just to be clear, it was, it was less prevalent, not because it wasn't necessarily correctly diagnosed, although it wasn't, it was less prevalent because it was less prevalent, right? There weren't right, as many right. Lyme so there's, uh, ticks there's, or, you're ticks. exactly right. There's, there's, there were two distinct things going on there. It wasn't, wasn't well diagnosed because the diagnostic test sucked and continues to suck by the way. Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it really was less prevalent because there were fewer ticks and you know, fewer um, infected mice and infected deer that were spreading it around. Anyway, so you had this vaccine for a disease that was not particularly prevalent. And as we see, People don't always love getting vaccinated against <laughs> things that like do have a risk of killing them and and um, and infecting them. So Lyme disease was kind of thought of as well as something like hunters and hikers get. Why would you know most people want to get that vaccine? So it had like a marketing issue to begin with because there wasn't a lot of interest in it. But then the actual like the the controversy that came out of it was it suffered from some internet rumors that as per usual had like one little kernel of reality and then like took on a life of its own. So the Lyme disease vaccine is a single purified protein. It's totally synthetic. So, you know, there's, there's no bacteria grown in the process of making it. Mm -hmm. And this one, protein is called OSP-A. And it actually ended up being this super clever story where OSP-A is a protein that the Lyme disease agent makes and expresses while it's living inside the tick. And so what ends up happening is if you vaccinate a person with this OSP-A protein, they make antibodies to it. 
if an infected tick bites them and starts, you know, feeding on their blood, the tick sucks up a bunch of antibodies to OSP A and then binds up the organism when it's inside the tick. And then the person actually never becomes infected because the Lyme disease bacteria are um, are killed or, or hmm. basically are neutralized by the antibody while they're still in the tick. So it actually, it worked really well. It was very effective. So what's the problem? The problem is some people looked at this protein, OSPE, and said, well, there are certain people in the population that this, this protein has kind of the same sequence as a certain human protein that certain members of the population express. Not everybody, but just certain people. How many times can I say the word certain in a 60 second span? <laughs> we, should we should count. Um, so, so basically, somebody noticed that there was a little bit of similarity between these proteins. And the thought was, well, if you vaccinate a person and you stimulate them to make a really strong immune response, are they then going to have an autoimmune problem? Mm-hmm. Are the antibodies that are made because they were vaccinated against Lyme disease, are they then going to turn around and attack the human version? So as it turned out, somebody asked the question and then the internet interneted and it kind of became a life of its own. And people said, well, after being vaccinated, my you know father, brother, uncle, whatever, developed arthritis. And so this link was made in people's head between this vaccine was causing the arthritis. So that Ah. was sort of bad publicity. And then when you couple onto that, the fact that the vaccine wasn't really selling well to begin with, because nobody really, you know, outside of hunters and hikers who were outside all the time, nobody really wanted it. And so between those two things, GSK was like, I'm going to just pull this off voluntarily. Because it's costing me money, it's costing me reputation, and I, it's not really selling at all. So forget it. And so they pulled it off the market. And basically, in the time since then, you know, there have been at least five really well done, really extensive studies where they're looking at rates of people who were vaccinated with this OSPE vaccine, this Limerix vaccine, and people who were not, and what is the rate of them developing arthritis spontaneously? And it's exactly the same. So there's, you know, there's, it's one of those, like, there was this little kernel of a question that somebody asked, and then when you actually go and do the experiments and do the science, you say, oh, it turns out that's actually not a problem. But you can't unstick that from people's heads right, once it's already right. in there. So wow, I'm glad um, I asked you about that. You had tweeted uh, about the tick, and so that's how I started. So let that be the first part of our conversation, and so much sure. more to discuss. And as you, you know, your your observation on Twitter, by the way, of finding that tech tick this early in the year is not just an observation, but apparently uh, a it, it's it's happening earlier and earlier. And I've, I'm seeing that as you're talking, I'm just looking up the, the news stories on it. And one of them is, is this from New England? Uh, tick activity is starting early this year. Oh, this is from the uh, Army's website in Landstuhl, oh, yeah. Germany. Tick exposure can occur year round, but due to mild temperatures, Public Health Command Europe officials yeah. report an unusually high tick activity early in the year already. So the Department of Defense actually has this huge program for researching tick-borne diseases because ah. the, it's it actually causes not just you know acute illness, but it causes these like long-term disabilities and service members. So it's been identified as actually like a major troop readiness issue kind right. of thing. So, yeah, no, so they are invariably, they're out and about earlier as we have milder and milder winters. And so I actually put, I put that on Twitter, but I put it on Facebook as well. And a friend and and colleague um, who lives up for much further north, but on the coast of Maine, so it's, you know, much more temperate than where, where yeah. I live. Although I also live on the coast. Sorry, it doesn't matter. Anyway. So she is, she replied, like, we saw them all winter. 
we, they never just oh, stopped. Wow. They just, they never went dormant. And it was like, wow, that was crazy. So let's talk now. Uh, let's move off of Lyme and talk about coronavirus, COVID. And first of all, uh, how bad is it in China? And what uh, I'm hearing all kinds of different reports about one of their most populated provinces, basically 25 million people shutting down. Now, we're not China in terms of obviously our reactions at this point never was. But uh, right. I doubt we'll we'll ever see lockdowns like that again in in this country. But wh- how uh, what's happening there, and w- how concerned are you? Is one question I wanted to ask. So this is this is a tough one because China is doing very similar to what they did literally the first time we ever talked, which yeah. was they yeah, put these enormous think, yep. cities on lockdown and. You know, the the biggest and most obvious one is Shanghai. They completely locked Shanghai down, which is having like worldwide economic consequences and everything. The reason why it's a little bit different this time than the first time is that we're dealing with a population that is kind of fundamentally different than it was the first time. So the first time we had this completely novel virus. And nobody was immune to it. So there were no vaccines or anything like that. And now what we have is a novel variant of that virus that is way more transmissible than that first one. And so the issue with um, Omicron, both BA1 and BA2, which are both circulating in China, that we didn't see with the original strains is that these guys, even though all the COVID strains can be transmitted by inhalation. So the the kind of more common term would be like they're all airborne. Right. But the difference with Omicron is that we now know it can actually successfully travel up through air vents. And so you don't have to be in the same room as a person and you can then transmit to them. So that was not the case for the original strain. So you could isolate a person in one room and say the apartment next door would have no risk from, you know, an infected person being their neighbor. But now that's not the case. So the other thing to keep in mind where we might think, well, this isn't so bad, but in fact, I think it's, it's worse than it seems is, well, aren't people in China vaccinated now? And the answer is yes, many are, but the vaccine that was, developed and distributed in China was not super effective and it doesn't work nearly as well as, as ours do. So you have a population that doesn't have a lot of effective vaccine derived immunity and China never had the enormous um, kind of caseload that a lot of other countries did because they were so severe with lockdowns. So you don't have a lot of population immunity from, you know, sustained transmission right. either. And so you have this now super contagious variant that can spread in these big buildings where everybody's theoretically locked down and separated, but they're not because the ventilation systems are still allowing transmission of, of Omicron from one room to another. So if you think to like, I don't know if you've ever been to Shanghai, but nope. if you've, if you, if you just, even if you Google the skyline of it and just think of how many people are crammed together in those buildings, even though they're on other sides of a wall, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I wow. think that, so it's just, um, it, 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 you explained so many of the differences between just the way that they live and the effectiveness of their vaccine. Right. And that's why I really am glad I asked you that because I hadn't read that and I hadn't heard that. Uh, and I, I know that they're shutting down that whole province. And I just kept saying, if, the, if, if China's shutting down, you know, 25 million people, it must be terrible. And that means we're going to get it next. But with new developments become new sets of information that's what's so hard for the public obviously it's hard for scientists to stay updated physicians to stay updated on new treatments the rest of us we learn a thing we then get our google doctorate 
and then we don't get that thing updated because we're not doing <laughs> continuing education for a living because we have other lives. And therein lies a huge, I think, disconnect between the scientific community and the public. Sorry, oh, so you heard you, you heard you heard the end of my response um, um, where I said uh, there therein lies a disconnect between the public. Yes, I sure did. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of my colleagues and I were at first very hopeful when administration change happened, but particularly with the CDC director have not been super thrilled because the thought was you, <laughs> you can't, you're, you're not being an effective communicator right now. You, you can't, you can't keep changing the rules. And if you change the rules in a way that is changing them too soon, you have to tell people that they may have to change them back if if circumstances change. And if you don't tell people that ahead of time, and then you have to change them back as happened, you know, last June, then nobody believes you, nobody trusts you. And it's just, um, it's been incredibly frustrating, especially at this phase of things where, not all of us now agree on the proper strategies and mitigation measures. So for example, the other day, um, Lena Wen had a, she tweeted talking about the gridiron dinner in Washington. And she was saying like, this is a, a, you know, tremendous success. It's an example of how life goes on. And a lot of us were saying, are you kidding me? This is not, this is not good. This is this is not an example that we should be applauding because there was no need to have that dinner. There was no need to have everyone unmasked. There was no need to it it just it it was the sort of thing that was not necessary. And the problem now is that you have it was actually a great example of why we should be still continuing mitigation measures, because you now have a lot of people who are older adults who are now infected. And another thing that it illustrated um, is that now that we've kind of stopped covering testing and nobody's doing contract tracing anymore, okay, we know all of the infected politicians, right? Because they have staff that put out, you know, announcements about anything interesting happening in their life. We don't have any idea how many staff were infected, how many of them are out sick. How many of them, you know, may be experiencing trouble accessing medication and accessing treatment? And it, it just the whole thing was. Yeah, mad. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the headline of that story. CNN medical analyst hit from both sides of political aisle for asking when vaccinated can return to normal. And I want you to just read like two cents from this and then I'll, I'll let you respond. But she wrote sure. for those who don't agree that the vaccinated can return to pre-pandemic normal. I ask, what shall we all do? Perpetual masking? Forever not dining out? Avoiding large weddings and indoor gatherings, etc.? Virtually everything has risk, and zero COVID is not a viable strategy. Do you disagree with that? I don't disagree with the last part now. I think it could have been at one point, but um, I think that that horse is like, not only out right. of the barn that it's like in the next zip code at this point, but um, <laughs> it's <laughs> um, the the thing. So I'm glad you oh, asked. Just, um, I can't even. I'm just hearing from my producer. They just killed that horse that you're referring to. They just shot it down. Just Did as the you horse were... have COVID. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 the horse was me, hold on. Y- Yes, they're telling me it did in fact have COVID. I'm getting I knew it. more information. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for a second source. Oh, God. But um, yeah, this is too confirmation territory. But the, the thing that is so frustrating is she puts it like that. Well, what are we supposed to do? Mass perpetually? No. Being a responsible communicator, what you should have thought about and decided before opining is, okay, what are the metrics wherein we would return to normal? You know, and again, that's that's also the job of a policy person. But if you're going to go on CNN and say, you know, this is the expert view. Right. It's not the view of all experts. It's not remotely close to the view of all experts. So for me, 
and and it, conveniently enough, I just articulated this on on Twitter during my fun during my fun argument. For me, the metric wherein people can go back to normal is you have to look at it and say, when is everybody who wants to be protected? What tools do they need to be protected? So the first thing then is kids under five have to, there has to be an available vaccine. That's, I mean, it's not fair. It's, you're putting parents in an impossible situation and you're putting, um, you're putting kids at risk. Okay. So that's number one. And number two would be, I wanted, I would like to see FDA approval of a, of an interchangeable platform for updating vaccines for each new variant, similar to what exists for flu shots. So that each time there's a new variant, a pla- you know, without going through clinical trials over again, they would be able to update the shot and within a few months it would be available and people could go take it. Ah. To me, those are the two things that would be needed to go back to normal. And it, it's, it just, it was maddening to say, well, what are we supposed to do? Just mask forever? Well, no. you were alone. Doctors, political <laughs> commentators, journalists from either side of the debate criticized her for her, her comments. Uh, Interesting. I'll 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 catch up on the rest of that article. Well, that's a yeah. I thought it was frankly, it was just it was a real garbage take. Frankly, <laughs> you know? Megan May with the what? harsh words for Doctor Shots Fired. Um, yeah. Shots Fired. I'm pretty sure she has no idea who I am or that. Oh, I'm she's just, about so to find fine. out. But <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to create as uh, I'm going to create a real wedge between. I'm going to create a Twitter war. A for Twitter funsies. war. Twitter war. <laughs> Uh, well, la- let me just lastly ask you just about this new variant. Why is it B2, not BA2? Why is the dot for an understand? Why can't it just be <laughs> an, a new a new letter? So. Omicron. And why can't we give it? A, why is it got to be called Omicron, Delta, and, and now BA2? Is the next one's going to be like pound? Sign, <laughs> yeah, pound and then there's going to be a bitmoji of some sort, <laughs> and then the prince symbol, and it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what the but, hell are they doing? Though? It's well, hard enough to point. keep. A- so you're wading into the very contentious realm of viral taxonomy. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. So, I didn't mean to do that. Mean, I'm yeah, so sorry. You don't want to do that. Don't. No, don't, thank just, you. Don't. Just, I don't even just, know what the words you just said were. So just. So basically, so the idea I'll of call um, it whatever you want me to call it. Please don't teach me this thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. I will refrain myself. Basically, long story short, what you call a strain, a variant, a species of something, when that thing is not subject to a reproductive barrier, I'll tell you what that is in a second, is a topic that... Uh, Stubborn, pedantic, (laughs) neurotic individuals debate about endlessly. And so when we decide, when is this officially a new variant versus a sub-variant versus a merged variant versus is this the new pi variant? It's, there, there's not a hard and fast, concrete, agreed upon set of rules. All right, well, then why can we just call it the variant formerly known as? Because it hasn't adopted the Prince symbol yet. Okay, well, whenever Uh, that press conference (laughs) takes place, I'll allow you to interpret it for us. So how, you know, so I guess this gets back to, I mean, that's the variant that that they're dealing with in China, right? So so what do we know about this latest variant? And, And then obviously the other question that a lot of people really just want you to tell us the answer to is are the future variants of Corona of COVID going to get maybe less lethal, less dangerous. Maybe they'll still be as contagious, but we'll get weaker. I mean, I will, cause that's my, my brain wants it to be that. I understand completely why brains want it to be that. Yeah. One thing that we can say, and we, you and I've had this conversation before that evolution is always going to push to be more efficient at transmission. Right. And so like, if you have 10 kids, your 
share of the gene pool is bigger than someone who has one kid and it will be for generations, right? So there, it's always going to favor enhanced transmission. However, does that necessarily equal advance, uh, you know, enhanced disease or this idea that a lot of people are pushing um, that, you know, as the population adapts to COVID and it adapts to us and it always is going to get less, you, you know, less lethal. Well, I mean, last I checked, HIV is still pretty badass and it's been with us for a long, long time. So that the problem with that thinking is that it's, I think it makes intuitive sense to people, but it's not necessarily correct. And I'll give you a little food for thought on that. And, and a mathematical reason why I'm going to say I have no basis for predicting if it'll be more severe or less severe. Um, all right. So we had original SARS-CoV-2, OG, if you will. Yes. Um, <laughs> we then had the alpha variant. We had the beta variant and we had the gamma variant. And they were all, they all had by three different studies, they all had very equivalent disease to the the original strain like they the it wasn't the fatality rate wasn't much different the hospitalization rate wasn't much different blah and then the next variant of concern that we had was delta which by all accounts was more severe and then after that was omicron which by accounts is less severe so we have an original strain and we have five variants Three were tied, one was worse, one was better. So it's literally, there is no basis for saying one way or the other if it's going to be more severe right, or less severe. Right, right. Um, the only thing we can guarantee is that it will probably be more as or more transmissible. Sorry, I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, no, I wanted to hear whatever the truth is. I can, I can take it. I just... Also wanted to hear the 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 teaching behind it, the, edu- the 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 information behind it. So I appreciate that. That makes a tremendous amount of sense. I feel smarter already, as I always do when I talk to you. And so I don't know. I will let you go because you have a life to live and science to teach and children to take care of. I thank you <laughs> so much. Children to pick up from track practice. Oh, good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Oh, goodness. what what, what is he doing? Uh, what event? So t- um, they are still deciding because spring track just started a couple of weeks ago. So they're still doing the showcasing and deciding what they're going to do. Uh, last summer he did, he loved long jump and javelin and fall is cross country. So it's just, you know, run and javelin. Do, they do have a javelin at your school. We didn't, I don't think they oh, let our Team I mean, javelin. it's like a faux javelin. It's not like one where you could actually <laughs> impale somebody because, you know, I don't think that I would give that to you'd a middle think, schooler. Yeah, you'd think you'd hear more javelin <laughs> accidents, but you don't really. But you'd yeah, think you'd hear more archery accidents, too. But you're the scientist. Well, no matter what, I'll let you go. And I appreciate it's so great to catch up with you. Thank you so much for taking my call. Everybody loves you. Oh, no, I I love everybody, and it's great to hear from you, and I hope everything's going well. All right, I'll talk to you soon, Megan. Thank you. All right, talk to you later. There she goes. Isn't she the best? Dot DR May 5. DR May 5 on Twitter. Go let her know you heard her here on the show. Megan May, always a pleasure. Love talking to her. It's so much fun, and I always learn a lot from her. From her, and I learned a lot from my first guest as well, Eugene Linden. His book, Fire and Flood, go get it. Thank you to Pete Co for the jingle and the intro. Thank you to John Carroll for the music, as always. Please support those guys. Been using Patrick Wilson's creations for the transitions. Go to indeed.com slash stand up and at least click on that link so I get the numbers. And as always, thank you, everybody who supports the podcast with a paid subscription because the podcast is free, but it ain't cheap. I'm putting a lot into it every day. So please sign up if you haven't already. And welcome to new subscribers. Hope to see you at Thursday night hangout. That's all I've got for you today. John Carroll, take us out, brother. Right.
Sins on light, you gotta stand up. That's right, you got to rise up, you got to stand up, you gotta stare the devil straight in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear, and all you hear is a lie. Go get up off of your butt, get down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making. And you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town. Just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Why you lying awake wondering where the money all went? It'll be the cost of freedom that'll go on its way. You can see him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up, up. alright We got to speak up, we got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 